Hello, habari, karibuni, welcome to Rooted Fellowship. My name is Naile Jileji and I will be your host for today. Rooted Fellowship is about three things. We are gospel-centered, disciple-making, and transcultural. We are also a generous church. If you would like to know more about these three things and the various ways you can give to the Lord's work here at Rooted Fellowship, please visit our website. We understand that these are challenging times, so if you are in need, please send us an email at community at rootedfellowship.com. We are now going to worship God in song. We are currently in Mark season three. Today, Pastor Sitley from Renewal Fellowship will be preaching God's word. We are now going to listen to God's word. Greetings, friends. Uh, my name is Sitley. Uh, I have a privilege of leading a church plant in Johannesburg. Um, it's actually a rooted fellowship, a church plant. Uh, we call ourselves Renewal Fellowship. We are in Johannesburg. And uh, I have the privilege of bringing God's word uh, to us uh, today. We are still in the book of Mark. I think it's season three now. And we will be in Mark 11 from verse 12 to 25. 
what I'll do is I'll read the text for us, I'll pray, and then we'll jump into the text. So I'll read the text for us, uh, and then I'll pray, and then we'll jump in, in into our text for today. So we are in Mark 11 from verse 12 to verse 20, 25. Let's hear God's word. The next day, when they went out from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree with leaves, he went to find out if there was anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. They came to Jerusalem, and he went into the temple and began to throw out those buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves and will not permit anyone to carry goods through the, the temple. He was teaching them, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. The chief priests and the scribes heard it and started looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him because the whole crowd was astonished by his teaching. Whenever, whenever evening came, they would go out of the city. Early in the morning, as they were passing by, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus replied to them, Have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, Be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, everything you pray and ask for, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven will also forgive you your wrongdoing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is true. Thank you that your word is life, it is living. Uh, thank you that your word is light to us. Um, I pray that now as you open up your word, that by your spirit, you'll make your word alive. Uh, that, Lord, you would speak to us. Um, I pray that what we do not know, will, will you teach us what we do not have? May you give us what we are not. May you make us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are a few things that I actually dislike uh, more than anything than, than false or misleading advertising, uh, especially the, the, you know, when it comes to food. You know, I don't know if you've seen when you uh, look at uh, a menu or something like that and you see something is big, something looks nice, but actually when you go out and eat it or when you order it and eat it, it's actually not the same thing. Um, I've seen that actually they, they, they use something called photo enhancement software to enhance the actual appearance of the food item so that you can buy it. Man, I, I don't like the stuff. I don't like to be deceived when th something looks like it's something great, but actually it's not, it's not that. Um, they, I mean, they've had me many times where something, it's not even just food, but anything that is misleading in, 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 in their advertising, when you get to the real thing, it's not the real thing. That really gets to me. I don't know if, if you know that Red Bull actually paid a settlement of $13 million uh, because of the, of the lawsuit where some people brought in uh, who claim that Red Bull claims that it will give you wings, but it actually does not give you wings. Uh, now, you could say that, you know, come on, you know, that is why would people take them literally? Uh, but that does give a, a, a sort of a responsibility for people who are advertising to tell the truth about their product. Now, I'm saying all of this because our text today deal exactly with that. It deals with uh, a false advertising, the notion of false advertising, but not just some random product, uh, but it's talking about, about us as people, about us as the church. Is there a chance that we say we are something, but we are actually not? Is there a chance that we, we, we sort of uh, advertise something to say, this is who we are as people, individuals. This is who we are as the church of the Lord Jesus. But when people come in, we are actually something different. And Marx gives us a story 
uh, that shows us that, the danger of that, the danger of saying you're something else, but actually you are not. Now, what we see in our text actually starts, the narrative starts at the beginning of of Mark 11, which we won't get to this week. I think someone who will be preaching next week will get into that because that has to do with Palm Sunday. Uh, I don't want to to, to, uh, mess it up for someone who's going to be preaching that next week, but it picks up from there. It picks up with Jesus who was in Jerusalem from Palm Sunday. He goes back to Bethany um, uh, for a sleepover with the disciples, and then it picks up in the morning. The next day, it says, when they go back to Jerusalem, to the temple. Mark gives us a story where Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem with his disciples here. They are coming from Bethany. This is just after Palm Sunday, as I've mentioned, just after Palm Sunday. And, you know, we saw in Palm Sunday the entry with the donkey. So this is the next day after that. And it says the next day they went out from Bethany and he was hungry. This is Jesus who was hungry. And seeing it from a distance so from a distance he sees a fig tree Uh, he sees a fig tree from the distance and he approaches the fig tree hoping that he will find some figs it says seeing in the distance a fig tree with leaves he went to found out if there was anything on it when he came to it he found nothing but leaves for it was not the season for figs he said to it may no one ever eat the fruit from you again and his disciples heard that now you may be wondering what exactly is going on here and and that could be because you you know most of us don't know about fig trees don't most of us don't know exactly what what's happening what's happening here jesus sees this tree from a distance and he sees that it has leaves now if you know anything about fig trees the fig tree actually starts out with on, on its season it starts out with figs coming out and then the figs when they come out the, then the trees come out to cover the figs so so the figs the, the figs come out first before the leaves. So if the fig tree has leaves, it means that it already has figs. So if you see a fig tree with leaves, leaves, it means that it already has figs. But here on this tree, Jesus sees the tree, and then he sees that it has leaves, and he thinks, obviously, that it has figs. But when he gets there, there was nothing on it. In other words, again, it was false advertising. It says, this is what I have, but actually it doesn't have that. It was professing one thing and then it was delivering another. You know, that was, it was appealing from a distance, but on close, on close inspection, it has no real fruit uh, for Jesus. It had no real fruit to offer to anyone. Now, Jesus then uses this as, as, a, as, a, as a parable to teach something. You know, this is typical Jesus. He's using it. It's not just something we look at it to say, oh, what's going on here? But he's using it to teach something. Because after that, he curses the tree. He curses the tree. He says, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard this. Again, this is about this tree that professes, that looks like that it should have fruit, but then it does not have fruit. And Jesus curses that tree and he's teaching something about that tree now what we will need to understand about uh, this whole passage is is understanding the way mark tells his narratives the way mark tells his story mark has something that is that some uh, uh, scholars have called a sandwich the way he tells the story the t- the, the sandwich has something to do with you tell a story Uh, You leave that story, you tell another story, and then you come back to the story that you've told. Now, if we know a sandwich, a sandwich has two breads. You've got the first bread, and then you have a filling. It could be a patty, it could be, you know, peanut butter, whatever you put in your sandwich. And then you have the second bread. So you have the first bread, you have the filling that you put in, and then you have the second bread. Now, the way that the sandwich telling a story in a sandwich form is... You will tell a story, let's say that the story is A, you tell story A, and then you leave that that narrative, you go to another story, story B, and then you come back to story A again. Story A, 
story B, and story A again. That's, that is what we see here, the way Mark tells the story. He tells from verse 12 to verse 14, he tells us about this fig tree. And then from verse 15, he changes and he talks about the temple. And then in verse 20, he comes back to tell us about the fig tree again. It's the fig tree, it's the temple, and then it's the fig tree. Now, what scholars and everyone who knows about this storytelling in this way, it is that when you do that, these the breads or the first story and the second story, they actually tell the story about the one in the middle. All of these stories are connected. It's not just you're changing and you're going to another story. The other story is connected. In fact, the story in the middle is the main story, and the first and the second one um, tells the story about the first one. So when Jesus tells about the fig tree, and then he moves to the temple, he wants us to keep thinking about what is happening with the fig tree. The fig tree is going to explain what he's going to talk about in the temple. In this case, the fig tree, verse 12 and 14, and then he goes to verse 20 and 26 again, wrapping around the story of Jesus cleansing the, 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 the temple. Now, again, what we see here, you see J Jesus in verse 15 coming into Jerusalem, and then he, he goes, he went, he goes out into the temple and begin, begin to throw out those buying and selling. In other words, Jesus goes into the temple, he sees the temple has been turned into a market, and, and he starts putting away everything there. Um, you know, what we will see there. And he call, he says, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, not a den of thieves. Now, I want us to go back again to the fig tree story because for us to understand what's happening in the temple, we need to understand that. Now, Jesus, remember in the fig tree, he saw a fig tree that uh, uh, advertised that it has it has fruit. It has these leaves, but when it gets there, there are no leaves. What is Jesus teaching there? What, what, why is Jesus looking at this? He's saying that this tree is professing one thing, but is delivering another thing. Having not found any figs, he, he responds with disappointment, and then he, he curses the tree. Now, this incident is not just about Jesus' desire for food. It's not just about Jesus wanting to eat all of these things, all of, I mean, all of the figs, but it has to do with what he is teaching. The fig tree was proclaiming to be the hope of the hungry, only to fail them when the hungry responded. This, this was Jesus teaching us a lesson about us individually to say, are we something, are we selling something, are we looking at something else, but actually we are not? I just want to apply that in our lives. Is there a way that you are saying to people, listen, look, I, I, I look the part. I, 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 you know, you can find me in church and the way we can show our leaves is the way we do our religious things. You know, I, I, I know the songs at church. Um, uh, my neighbors, when they look at people, they know I go to church, I do all of these things. I have the leaves. I look the part. But on close inspection, will they find fruit in your life? Will they find fruit in your life on close in inspection? When people look at you from afar, they can see that you look the Christian part. They can see that you look the part but what does it look like on close inspection? What does it look like on every day of your life? If someone came in and lived with you for a week, what will they find? On close inspection, do you have fruit? Do you have fruit on close inspection? That, that's the, that's the, the teaching here that Jesus wants to bring to us. And he talks about that on the, with regards to the fig tree, but also with regards to the temple also with regards to the temple. Now, we, we move into the temple part. Now, what we see here, the story shifts from the fig tree into the temple. And I need you to get this about Mark's storytelling. Again, he's using the sandwich to tell the story. Now, we've I've already explained to us what the, the sandwich mean, meaning that he's explaining, the fig tree story is explaining what we see here on the temple. 
Jesus now leaving the cursed tree, he's moving with his disciples into Jerusalem. They join this throng of people going into the temple and only to found that they are there to do business. But sadly, for most of them, you know, they, they're not doing business with God as what was supposed to be happening with the temple. You are supposed to be doing business with God, but for them, they're just doing other business. Those who did not come, they did not come to do business with God. They've turned the temple into a marketplace. They've turned a temple into a den of thieves. A den of thieves only means that this is a safe house for thieves. This is a safe house for robbers. People who have come to rob people. Now, let me just explain quickly what was happening there. Because what was happening in the temple was people will come with their animals, which they'll have come to to. to to bring as their sacrifices, only to find out that the priest and the people there will say that their animals are not, uh, they have blemishes, they are not fit enough for, uh, for the sacrifices, and therefore they will sell them their own animals and make a profit of, of, of them. So they will say, you bring your animal that you, you brought with you, they said, this animal is not good enough. Tell you what, I have an animal that is good enough that I can sell it for you. And therefore they sell these people, it's a business for them. It's a huge business, actually. But also, they used to, when you pay, when you come to the temple, you'll also pay te temple tax. And, and the temple tax, you only needed a certain currency for temple tax. And it was also a way to, for them to, 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 to change currencies and make money off that. There's a lot of things that have turned to make business. And Jesus is not impressed. Jesus is not impressed. It says, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? Now again here, this has to do with the nation, the Gentiles, that they had a part in the temple. The temple had an outer court where the Gentiles would be praying to God. And that's exactly the place where all of these people have turned it into a marketplace. And Jesus is, is this not supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations? This is what the temple pointed out to. It was not just for Israel, but it has a place for all nations to come. But they've turned that place into a marketplace. And Jesus, having looked around, he knew what he needed to be done. Having observed the commercialization of worship, having witnessed the merchandising of the gospel, the sacrifices, and having seen the profane clutter that was keeping people from worship of the true God, he began to clean the house. He cleansed the temple. It says he began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. In one sense, there was nothing wrong with selling animals for sacrifice. After all, people needed these animals for them to, 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 to sacrifice. And the temple tax, again, needed to be paid. But those the way that those transactions have been done it was profit making it was something more than what was supposed to, to 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 happen we see now religious fraudsters have entered the temple they were taking advantage of the hungry they were taking advantage of people who have come to meet with god it seems that even the high priest was behind this and his family were, profiting, were, were making profit from the inflated prices and exorbitant exchange fees. Think about this. Those you've entrusted with the worship of God were making profit of people's sins and their need for redemption. They were profiting off men's desire to be right with God. These people are making a profit of out of people's desire to be right with God. And Jesus cleans the house. He denounces the temple. He denounces this system of domination that it, it now represents. The temple has become the center of power for nobility of those who dominated, controlled, and exploited those who were of lower ranking. The temple has preserved the, 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 the status quo of exploiting people, and Jesus will not have that. Jesus is not impressed at all at what was going on here, and then he flips everything upside down. 
And what is Jesus does here eventually gets him into trouble because this is the thing that actually takes him to the cross. The chief priest in verse 18, it says, the chief priest and the scribes heard it and started looking for a way to kill him. It got Jesus into trouble. Now again, a few things about this temple. This is a temple that was built by Herod. This is the temple that was big and extravagant. And, and it, it took more than 45 years to build this temple. It was massive. It was beautiful. It was, it was a massive temple. On the outside, it, it, it says this is the place you come to do business with God. This is the temple that everyone knew you, when you need your sins to be forgiven, when you need uh, uh, intercessions with God, this is the place you go to from the outside. It's a place you come in to get your sins forgiven, to get right with God. On the inside, it was something else. It was a marketplace. It was a stock market. Remember the similarity with the fig tree? On the outside, it has the leaves, but, but it had no fruit. Same thing with the temple. The sacred place meant for prayer and communion with God has become a den of thieves on the inside. It has become a den of thieves on the inside. And now here's the point. And Jesus turns this whole thing upside down. In fact, after that, the temple doesn't even operate at all because a few years after that, the temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. So the temple is all, is, ends up getting totally destroyed. Now, in Israel, here's the, here's the point. What, what's the heart of Israel? What's in the heart of Israel in Jerusalem was at the heart of Jerusalem, in meaning that it was the temple. I mean, what was at the heart of Israel was Jerusalem. And what was at the heart of Jerusalem was the temple. The temple was the heart of Israel's people's lives. If you destroy the temple, they're going to be like, what, what, what do we have left? It was at the center of their lives. And Jesus shut it all down, just like he did with the fig tree. He shuts it all down. Now, we might not think that this is a big deal about the destruction of the temple. But for Israelites, for the people of God in Israel, it was a big thing. The temple was their faith. You know, the temple was to your faith what the heart is to your body. You try and remove the heart from your body, it is almost like it's not going to function. It was almost like that exactly what was removing the temple from Israel. It's like you're ripping off the heart of Israel. They would ask themselves, where do we go to meet God? Where do we go to pray? Where do we go to bring out our sacrifices? Where does our high priest go to atone for our sins? Where does the high priest go to intercede for us? Where, where, what do we do? You take out the temple, you take out the life, the heart of Israel. What do you do when that heart, what do they do when their heart is being removed? But actually, Jesus destroys this temple because he's ushering a new thing. He's ushering a new thing about what it means to be the people of God about what it means to commune with God is ushering a new thing. This is exactly why Jesus came, to give his people a new heart, as it were. This heart that was a temple, he's coming in to bring in a new heart, to, uh, to change the center, to take the heart of the temple and to replace it with himself to replace the temple with himself. He is now, Jesus, the center of God's people. He is now that temple. He's the fulfillment of everything the temple was supposed to be. He told his disciples and they didn't understand him. He said, destroy this temple, talking about this temple, and I will build it in three days. And they didn't get that he was talking about himself. He has come to usher in a new thing. He was the temple. He was what the temple pointed to. He will be the one who will be with the down on the tree under the judgment of God and be up again in three days. Now everything that, everything that the temple was, he is. Where does God dwell? Colossians 1.19 The fullness of God dwells in Jesus. Where do we now go to meet God? 
we meet God in Christ. How about the sacrifices that we need? He is the sacrifice, Jesus Christ. How about the high priest? The Jesus is our high priest. You want to meet God? Go to Jesus. You want to worship God? Go to Jesus. Jesus is now at the heart of his people. That is why as Christians, we don't go to pilgrimages. We don't go to certain places. We meet with Jesus. He's our high priest. He's our temple. He's the meeting place with God and man. And Jesus ushers in this new thing by destroying the temple because it was pointing to himself. But again, it doesn't take away what was happening in the temple. It doesn't take away what Jesus condemns about what that temple had now represented. He's coming into this institution that was trusted, but it has turned out to be exploiting people. And this is a sobering thing that Jesus does because we need to, in, to look at ourselves as the church of Christ. We have everything that says, you know, we are the church. If you want to meet with God, come. If you want to, 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 to worship with God's people, come. We say all of these things, but when people come in, what do they find? Do we still have what we are supposed to have when people come to worship God? If Jesus would come and inspect us as the church, would we, will he flip the tables? If Jesus comes and, ex, and, and, and inspects us, will he find fruit as the church? I don't want to be talking about you know, churches out there or anything. I, I just think we just need to talk about ourselves. Because I mean, we see that everywhere. What is supposed to be a place of worship, what is supposed to be a place where people meet with God, it has become a den of thieves. It has become a den of thieves, a place of robbers. We see that everywhere on the news. But we need not just to look out there, to look at ourselves. Do we still have Jesus at the center? Do we still have the gospel at the center? With everything that we might have, everything, whatever we advertise, whatever we say we want to, people to get, are they getting Jesus? Are they getting the gospel? We need to be careful. We need to think about these things. Otherwise, Jesus will flip our table. Will flip our table. Are we nothing but leaves? Are we nothing but leaves? Have we become just merchandising of religion of religious stuff? Or do we still have Christ at the center? Now, this is just us corporately as the church, but also individually. Again, like that fig tree. Are we nothing but leaves? Are we saying this is who we are, but when people interact with us, when people come close into our lives, they find nothing. They find no compassion. They find no love. They don't find these things that we suppose to have. Now the question is, how do we guard against becoming nothing but leaves? How do we guard against becoming nothing but leaves? We see in verse 20, it says again, he comes back to the, to, to the fig tree analogy. Early in the morning as they were passing by, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Then Peter remembered and said to, to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus replied to them, have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believe that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, everything you pray and ask for, believe that you have received and it will be yours. And wherever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven will also forgive you of your wrongdoing. Jesus brings three things here that are also marks of, of people with, with, with fruit. How do we guard against becoming nothing but leaves? Faith, prayer, 
forgiveness. That's what we see here. Have faith in God. And then he says, you know, ask God. Ask and believe that you have received it. Prayer. And then he says in lastly in verse 25, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him. How do you how do you guard against having nothing but leaves? Do you still trust God? Do you have faith in God? Have faith in God. And then he uses the analogy of, of this faith that can say to this, to this mountain to be lifted up and been thrown into the sea. Now again, this is not a literal thing. This is the saying that was used in a Jewish context of, 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 of having a, like a big, big faith. Have, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Trust God. Trust God in what he has done for us. What he has done in Christ. Do you still marvel at what God has done in Christ for you? Romans 8 says, if he has freely given his only son for us, will he not also give us what we need? If he has done this thing that we needed the most, because of our sin, we needed saving, we needed rescuing. He has sent his son, Jesus, who has gone to the cross and taken the judgment of God for us. He has died, he has risen from the dead, and he's calling us now into this new life. Do we trust that God will continue to be with us? We live in very difficult times. Do you still have faith? Do you still trust God? Do you still have fruit? Oh, it's just, you're still just advertising, but there's nothing in there. Do you still have faith? Are you still a prayerful person? It says, therefore, I tell you, everything you pray and ask for, believe that you have received it and it will be and it will be yours. Now, again, some people have used this as a blank check to say, you just, you know, Jesus is going to give you everything. But again, I mean, even when you talk about everything, it's still in a part of the context. Jesus, there's a place where he says, he's not, you're not going to ask for bread and he's going to give you a scorpion, meaning that he's not going to give you something that's going to harm you. So even the whatever is not something that's going to harm you. It's something that is within his will for you. But ask. The, 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 the thing here is ask big things from God. Do you still have faith? Do you, are you still a prayerful person? Do you still believe that God has your back? That God, you can pray and he will answer. Do you still have faith? Do you still Pray. You're still a, pre- a person of prayer. And do you have forgiveness in your heart? Whenever you stand praying, and here Jesus uses prayer and forgiveness to come together. To so say, even when you come to pray, do you come to pray with unforgiveness? Whenever you stand praying, you have anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven will also forgive you for your wrongdoing. We are people of God and we are people marked by forgiveness. Forgiveness is part of our mark as Christians. We people who forgive because we, we've been forgiven. We understand that. This is why he's saying because your Father in heaven will also forgive you. We understand forgiveness because we know the gospel. God has forgiven us in Christ. God has taken away our sin and forgiven us. It, it has not come without a cost. It cost his son, the Lord Jesus. And he's saying, go likewise and do for others. Do you have anyone you need to forgive? Again, look from the outside, you look great. From the inside, do you have unforgiveness? From the outside, you look great. But from the inside, do you have faith? From the outside, you look great. But do, are you a person of prayer? These are the marks, basic marks of a believer. In this whole text, Jesus is dealing with false advertising. That what we, pop, what we want, what we say to people out there, as the church, but also individually, when people come close to us, when Jesus comes close into our lives, does he find fruit? Does he find that we are bearing fruit? Or it is just false advertising? My prayer is that he will find fruit. And may God may revive us, revive us in the gospel, 
Revive us in our prayer life. Revive us in trusting him. Revive us in being marked with forgiveness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that your word, again, it meets us from where we are. Lord, I pray for all of us. Then, Lord, we will not just be just false advertising, but, Lord, we would have fruit within our lives. Fruit of prayer, a fruit of faith, and a fruit of forgiveness. Strengthen us, we pray, because we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've come to the end of our digital gathering. We pray that you have been challenged, encouraged, and comforted. Please don't forget to like, subscribe to our channel, and hit the notification bell. We normally end our service with a benediction or a good word. Today's benediction comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Have a blessed week.